Imagine you're driving back from a friend's house. It's pretty late, they live in the middle of nowhere, and all you can think about is getting home, taking a nice hot shower, and passing out. All of a sudden, your car starts sputtering. You have to pull off the road. Oh well, you're still not panicking. You'll just call for an Uber or something. Then you realize that you forgot to charge your phone. Or you don't get cell service out here. Or maybe you even left it back at your friend's house. Now you're panicking. Most of us have grown up in a world made accessible to us by phone. Even if you can't afford a computer, a car, a house, you probably still have a cell phone. In the age we live in, it would be near impossible to do anything without one. It can make calls, send texts, and if you have a smartphone, you can even access the internet. Having any kind of phone at all, even a Nokia brick phone, is invaluable if you want to remain in contact with others. Something that was already becoming increasingly difficult to do even before we were hit with a highly contagious pandemic that required all of us to self-isolate. In a world that seems to be getting bigger and lonelier every day, phones are a tether to connect us to coworkers, friends, and family. That's beautiful. But that's also not the whole story, right? I, like a lot of you according to my audience analytics, was a child born in between the era of we had a functioning VCR and regularly went to Hollywood Video or Blockbuster and kids in my 7th grade class were using iPhones. I have a practical memory of old landline phones as well as a nostalgic and abstract notion of the corded landline telephone. And in that sense, the sound of the old-timey dial tone is something that can be so personal and so unsettling, like the ghost of technology's past. The number you have dialed, the number you have dialed, has been disconnected. I know we don't really think of objects, especially technology, as having a memory or a ghost attached to it, but I am far from the first person to bring up this connection, okay? In fact, according to the article, Ghost in the Machine, Inside the Internet's Paranormal History, author Bijou Belenke references the direct connection, writing, Within paranormal investigation circles, the everyday ghost is seen as a fan of electrical devices. The answer for why that is can be easily explained, according to Steve Parsons, who has been a paranormal investigator for the past 40 years. Consider that radios and telephones are already direct voice communication devices, which renders the possibility that, if connections could take place, those would be the most obvious and likely methods to be employed. When, for example, the SETI project astronomers and scientists were looking for evidence of alien life forms, they also turned to radio communications and electromagnetic emissions as the most probable and likely area to look for evidence. So it would appear logical that if we're looking for an exchange, it would start with a device meant for that, rather than a planchette on a table or a glass. So, ghosts, schools, and all sorts of other unsavory characters are only ever a phone call away. And though Parsons is referring specifically to the supernatural, the idea still holds up for the ordinary world, right? Meaning, phones may have made it easier for us to connect with loved ones, but it also made it that much harder to distance ourselves from people that we would rather not hear from again. In the paper, Latent Functions of the Telephone, What Missing the Extension Means, authors Alan H. Wurzel and Colin Turner argue, Though the telephone fosters mobility by promoting instant contact, it also annexes an individual's personal space into the existential realm of those who have his phone number. Though it dispels isolation by providing a sense of open channels, it also puts a person at the mercy of others' communicative needs. The telephone may well bolster the urban dweller's feelings of control, but in reality, it exacts a price in interruptions and the unchosen investment of time. Basically, they say that people tend to view the advent of the telephone call as an inherently positive thing, making us able to keep in touch with a network of others and maintain connections. But the authors argue that this is nothing more than a pleasant veneer, obstructing us from seeing some of the more sinister aspects of this connection. Yes, it's true that you have access to people that would ordinarily only be available to you through snail mail or otherwise not available to you at all, 
You're only 11 digits away from calling your aunt that lives across the country, your old college friend that you don't want to lose in touch with. But it also means that you're only 11 digits away from whoever wants to look you up in the phone book. Or maybe find you in the staff directory at your job. Or just a very committed stranger. In the Bollywood psychological thriller, Dud, Giddin Awasthi is a happy-go-lucky young woman who finds herself terrorized by phone calls from an obsessive stalker claiming to be in love with her. This stalker, the audience comes to learn, is Rahul, an old college classmate of Giddin's who's always had a crush on her since their college days, but was never quite able to bring himself to confess. We know this but Giddin has no idea. The movie was released in 1993, before the advent of caller ID, and Giddin's struggle reflects Wurzel and Turner's theory about the darker side of the telephone call perfectly. Giddin and her family are at the mercy of Rahul's deranged phone calls, and yes, they could disconnect the lines to stop his calls from coming through at all, but this would also serve to sever their instant contact with the outside world altogether, leaving them isolated. So all Giddin can do is let the phone ring, and hope that if she picks up, she won't hear the familiar voice stutter her name into the receiver. But let's explore that threat of isolation a little bit more. You might be asking, why didn't Giddin alert the authorities, get their help tracking this guy down? The invention of the telephone and its subsequent popular use were meant to connect us to one another, provide easy access to assistance when we may need it, so why not call the police and report this behavior? Well, first, you'd have to realize that the police rarely take reports concerning threats of stalking and abuse seriously, even when the victim of said threats is someone as high-profile as singer Lily Allen, for example. It is often only when the stalker commits a crime against property, e.g. criminal damage or burglary, that the police will take action, often still failing to address the essence of the behavior, the stalking. In the case of Lily Allen, it was only when her stalker committed the terrifying act of breaking into her home that he was charged. But even then, he was charged with burglary and harassment rather than stalking. When people think of harassment, they might think of disputes about hedges between neighbors. Stalking is something entirely different and is dangerous. Half of all domestic violence-related stalkers will carry out the threats they make against the victim. And in stranger stalking cases, it's 1 in 10. So it is vital that this is taken seriously. That's in real life, though. In the scope of the movie, when it becomes clear that Giddens' stalker is not just playing a sick joke on them, they do in fact involve the local authorities who do take it seriously and monitor the call to see if they can track down where the caller is calling from and thus find the stalker. This ultimately yields no results as Rahul is media savvy enough to be aware that his location could be tracked over the course of a phone call. For this particular call that they choose to track, they triangulate his location only to discover the call was coming from inside the house from one of the rooms in their house more specifically. And of course, Rahul is long gone by the time they reach that room. Switching gears for a bit, let's talk about one of the most iconic slasher telephone calls in horror movie history. The opening scene of Scream. It's become iconic with young Drew Barrymore slyly going back and forth with the stranger on the phone who asks her questions about horror movies before eventually revealing that he's already killed her boyfriend and is here to kill her too. Uh, spoilers for Scream, by the way, but you know what? If you haven't seen it yet, that's on you. If you could choose any singular shot to encapsulate that scene, it would likely be a shot of Drew Barrymore clutching the phone to her face in terror. The phone in this case becomes both a hypothetical tool for salvation as well as a vehicle for terror. Charles Spiteri expands on this idea in the article Isolation and Subjugation, the Telephone in the Slasher Film. The danger becomes clear when the other lets out that he is watching her from the patio window. Listen, I'm two seconds away from calling the police, says Casey, to which he replies, they'd never make it in time. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And suddenly, the illusion of safety and control that the telephone provided is shattered. Here, unlike in past slasher films, there is an understanding that as much as the telephone connects us to the community, a spatial and geographic isolation remains that even the telephone cannot displace. The illusory nature of any connections we make via the telephone gives us a sense of safety that is also, in fact, 
illusory. The supposed safety a phone provides is dubious at best. You can comfort yourself by holding on to the idea that help is always a phone call away, but that's assuming that the person you call will be any better equipped to handle a situation than you are. And despite your voices no longer being constricted by the limitations of space and distance, the same is not true for your bodies. Sure, you could immediately dial up your bodybuilder cousin who keeps a giant hatchet in the trunk of their car for help, but there's nothing you can do after that except wait for them to arrive. They tell you they're only 15 minutes away, 10 if they speed, which you know they will, but there's someone in your house right now. Who knows what might happen in the span of 10 minutes? An added layer of horror to the phone call is the anonymity that it provides. In a scenario such as this, where one party knows almost everything about the other, and the second party doesn't even know who the other is, isolation is not a viable option. Scream explores the horror of not being able to tell who's on the other end of the call. As I said earlier, this was the time of landline phones before caller ID. Even cell phones were a rarity, though they had entered the American social consciousness by this point. Over the course of the movie, many of the potential victims of Ghostface would get calls from their would-be murderer before their eventual demise. These calls become a hallmark of the killer. A calling card, you could say. <laughs> While Sydney tries to navigate the stress of murder and high school, she finds her own boyfriend, Billy, picked up as a suspect. He does have a personal cell phone, after all. Billy couldn't possibly be the murderer, though, because Sydney receives another call from the killer while Billy is locked up. And if he was in jail while she got the call, there's no way the killer could be him, right? We soon learn that this is just another clever misdirection, though, as it is later revealed that Billy had an accomplice in the form of his friend Stu. Stu was the one who made the call to Sydney to cover for Billy while he was in jail and throw suspicion off of him. The two worked as a team to carry out the kills as well, with one making the calls while the other did the deed. This kind of trick is not only made possible through the anonymity of the phone call, it is actually entirely dependent on it. You're not looking someone in the face or noticing the height difference between Skeet Ulrich and Matthew Lillard. On a phone call, all you have to go off of is the modulated voice crackling through the receiver. In a broader sense, it is the decentralization of a threat. That sounds pretentious, but I'll explain. Christopher Lombardo touches on this idea of the decentralized threat or danger in his article, Creepy Calls, the Telephone and Horror Films. By the way, I always list and link all sources I reference in my videos in the description box below if you're ever curious. He references the ideas of Canadian media theorist Marshall McLuhan. Lombardo says, McLuhan correctly predicted the power of the telephone to decentralize every operation, and he didn't live to see continents apart call centers but he did point out a few unexpected social results of the technology, including the elimination of the red light district in favor of the call girl who could work remotely, unburdened by technology. Landlines provide much fodder for horror fare. After all, you could always cross the street if there was someone who looked suspicious. But a decentralized stalker sets the imagination into panopticon overdrive with the ring acting as its own jump scare. Futurist Ray Kurzweil said, The telephone is virtual reality. It's as if you are together with that other person, at least as far as one sense is concerned, the auditory sense. In the slasher movie, a phone call from a stranger is an arena of danger, of the horror of the unknown. It's much like looking through a one-way mirror. The other can see you just fine, but you're stuck looking into your own frightened reflection staring back at you. The slasher telephone call is danger without a direct source, fear without an outlet. 